Throughout our time together this past almost four months now, you may have noticed that I have been selecting scriptures and stories that re reflect life as it sometimes is when we least expect it. We first talked about, as I've mentioned already, unexpected journeys in our lives, things that happen to us when we least expect it, illness, change in relationships, a job loss, and other times when we must begin a new journey compared to what we thought we would be able to do and what we had planned to do. We suggested that we continue this journey called a faith journey and to not give up. We then talked about taking the first step in life when it means what it means to take that first step. When we reach out to those who are difficult to love, perhaps, and those who may be considered our enemies. Sometimes it requires that we make the first call, write the first note, maybe do the first email in today's world. Sometimes it requires an extra effort to reach out to someone who would probably really like to hear from us, a, a family member that you haven't contacted in a while, a business association that you used to work with, associate, any number of things that might benefit from a contact from one of you and me. We discuss the need of those who might like to hear from us but often it is like taking the first step. I like the saying of Dr. Martin Luther King who, when he said, go ahead and take the first step, even though you can't see the total staircase. Taking the first step sometimes can be scary. It's an unknown step, but he's suggesting that we go ahead Take the first step, make that call, make that visit, even though we don't know what the outcome may be. We also suggested that if we love those who are sometimes difficult to love, Jesus asked us, to, what Jesus asked us to do then is to be prepared and to reach out to those who need comfort, need someone to love them maybe someone to give them a hug. Be prepared though. It can and it will change your life. We talked about the in-between times and I thought of that this past week in North Carolina when we were talking about interim pastors and transitional pastors and churches in transition, churches who need um, new direction perhaps, a new, a new start, a new beginning. Those in-between times. The first century church believed Jesus would return in their lifetime. And so for over 2,000 years, Christians have been living in the in-between times. And so today, I wanna to think with you about the times in our lives that we can either look at circumstances as a problem or an opportunity and how we react when, we, when life seems to have us perplexed and confused and angry and scared. Today's scripture is a very familiar story in Luke, one in which you have read about and heard preached about many times, I suspect. It is a parable and therefore really didn't happen according to some theologians and some professors and some of those who are into learning and thinking about and uh, researching scripture. It was a parable. Jesus used parables. He told stories, did he not? And so our main story this morning is about the Good Samaritan very familiar to all of you, I'm sure. 
I heard about a group of people who were visiting the Holy Lands many years ago. And when they had a guide, they went out and he was showing them all around the countryside. And there were, at one point he stopped under the tree in the shade and he told a story. And the tour guide told and talked about Jesus and the Good Samaritan story. Well, it seems that afterwards, the pastor who was in charge of the group went to the guide, tour guide and said, uh, I thought this was a parable, and therefore it was just a story, and it didn't really happen. Well, the tour guide was a little taken by that, but he said, well, if it would have happened, this would have been a good place for it to happen. It is a well-known story, for sure, and has always been one of my favorites. But what is the main purpose of this parable? Is it all about helping people in need, or does it have other meanings? Let us look at a few ideas. For some people, it is a story about helping people, about going the extra mile, about reaching out to not only maybe those less fortunate, but just someone who is in need of help. For others, it has to do with the perspective eternal life. We talked about eternal life some in Montreat last week, and it is certainly a subject that I think bears a lot of thought and a lot of investigation and a lot of prayer and a lot of thinking about. And for others, it's just a nice little example of how to live and let others live. Luke writes that the lawyer asked a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer didn't ask anything about helping people, but rather he asked a question for and about himself. As he was expecting Jesus to say, if you work at it, you will inherit eternal life. But our faith teaches us that eternal life is a gift. We inherit from God through our relationship with him, not something we earn through works of righteousness. The lawyer asks Jesus two questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? Jesus then tells the story about the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan. The Samaritan, lowest of low in society. There was a man on the other side of the road. He had been robbed and hurt badly. He was then left there without help. A priest walks by and de deliberately put himself a safe distance away from the man who had been robbed and hurt. Then passed a Levite, a group of people who were well respected in the Jewish community. Maybe he and the priests were afraid of the robbers, or maybe they were afraid of ceremonial uncleanliness. Jesus then tells about a Samaritan who passed by, and he felt compassion. He then closed the story with another question. Which of these Three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. The lawyer answered, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Scholars believe Jesus told this story to show that eternal life is an inheritance of God for those who love him. Our love for one another truly reveals our love for God to show mercy and be a neighbor to the needy is the act of that love. Isn't it interesting that in the Ten Commandments, only the first two commandments deal with our relationship with God, and the other eight deal with our relationship with people, with humans, with our neighbor? I want to tell you a couple of stories about some things that have happened in my past and in my life 
One of them I think I've shared with you way back in the beginning, so I ask your forgiveness, but it seems to fit the sermon today. Many years ago, my wife asked me to go to a store during Christmas time to pick up a few items. I did, of course, and I had one of those moments of, uh, what do I do now? Because of what happened in the checkout line, the store was packed with shoppers and I tried to pick the line that was the shortest and the fastest. I selected a line and then it happened. There was a mom with three little boys who were being all the time just three little boys. They were very much out of control and she had purchased several items and she wanted to pay cash but she discovered that she did not have enough money with her. She began to look in all compartments of her purse. She began to look on the counter. She began to look uh, uh, just upset. And what do I do now? She had a look on her face. And the little boys continued to be rowdy. And the clerk became frustrated. And the clerk said, you'll have to take some items out of your basket in order for me to check you out properly and so you can leave. As I said, the mom looked very frantic. She looked in all compartments of her purse, but did not find any additional money. So what does one do in a situation like that? I wondered. I asked her if I could help. I gave her enough to cover the shortage, which was very, very minimal, and took her out and told her that I would give her my address and she could send me a check when she had time, if she wanted to. So she then looked at me and said, you must be a Christian. I honestly don't remember my answer, but I think it probably was one of those answers that went around the barn and outside the door and over the hill and the flowers of the field, and I gave her all this stuff. And years later, I thought about that, and I've I've thought about it to this day. What would I do if that happened this time, this year, or tomorrow, or this afternoon? What if I had that question? Instead of some big, flowery, theological answer, I hope I would simply say, I'm trying to be. Story number two. Many years ago, when I was traveling and representing a large company, I received word that the regional manager was planning a meeting in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. To be honest, I wasn't excited about that news. I had had a chip on my shoulder and I didn't want to go. I was smug about it and took the attitude of, I've heard this all before. But the day came and I needed to travel to the meeting I began driving down south on I-35, as I had done hundreds of times before. And when I was almost to Norman, I looked over and saw a young man walking on the side of the road. He was easy to find. He was easy to notice because he had on a complete uh, coat that went all the way to his ankles. It was a coat of many colors. It had patchwork and all kinds of emblems. Well, I'm thinking about the meeting and I just kept driving. I wanted to think about what the meeting would be like, etc. I didn't do anything about stopping and talking to that man or offering any assistance at that point. Well, I drove on and before I crossed the Red River, I purchased gas and some snacks and began my trip again. To my surprise, I was leaving the parking lot of the store. I looked over and saw to my amazement and astonishment the young man that I saw two hours previously. And he was walking on the pavement that I was about to drive out on. I noticed him, and again, I had one of those moments of, 
What do I do? What do I do about it? I stopped and watched him for a few seconds, and then an inner voice spoke to me, and I decided to offer him a ride. I pulled up beside him and lowered my window. He stopped and looked inside my car. I asked him where he was traveling to, and he said, San Antonio. I said, I, can't take, I can take you as far as Denton, he got in and said with a big grin, Hi, my name is Will. I then introduced myself. I began to ask him questions such as, Where is your home originally? California, he said. What brought you to this part of the world? Well, my father told me to leave and never come back. Where did you spend the night last night, I asked. I'm not sure what, what it was called, but I guess it was some kind of shelter. Have you eaten today? No, he said. We discussed other subjects, and it wasn't long until we were in Denton, where I was going to make a change in my, my road, and that I was going to leave I-35. I then asked two more questions. If you had a ticket, bus ticket to San Antonio, would you use it? Or do you prefer to hitch a ride as you can? He said a bus ticket would be wonderful. It would be great. He was planning to see an aunt in San Antonio before he picked up his travels again to go to California. I knew where the bus station was. And so that was our next stop. I went in and purchased a ticket with a connection in Dallas. We then went to a convenience store and I gave him a few dollars and suggested he buy some food to leave to have on the bus. I then took him back to the bus station and we said our goodbyes. I gave him my address and asked him when he got back to California to please write me and let me know that you made it home. It has now been probably close to 30 years. I'm still waiting for, for that letter. I would love to know how he is, what happened, and where he is. As he got out of the car, he looked at me and said, thank you for everything. I feel like God sent you to me today. I thanked him in return, and as I drove away, I saw him in my rearview mirror walking back into the bus station. And I thought, no, Will, maybe God sent you to me. And I began to count my blessings. I don't tell you those stories for a pat on the back or high fives as you leave the sanctuary today. I don't expect you to go around giving money away in grocery stores or picking up people on the highway. But I tell you that story just to let you know that, again, there are times in life that we have opportunities to react, to help, to be a good neighbor. So here we are, almost at the end of four months of being together. And for me, it has been an unexpected journey, as perhaps it's been an unexpected journey for you. A change of senior pastors is not always easy sometimes, and I just commend you for your patience and attitude as we have spent the last four months together. And so I ask for your prayers once again to the PNC and for our time together as we continue being Santa Fe Church. I want to close with one other brief story. It is what we call perhaps a fable, I suppose, but I hope you will think it is relevant and helpful to today's sermon. It seemed there was once an old wizard who lived on top of a mountain. 
that looked down onto a small village. He never went into the village. He was recluse and stayed inside his house all of the time. He never went anywhere. Nobody knew what, really knew what he looked like or what he did. But there was a time when a few little boys started talking about the wizard. What does he look like? How does he sound? Does he have a family? What's inside his house? And so one day a little boy uh, told all of his friends that he was brave enough to climb the mountain and meet the wizard. So he began walking up the mountain and finally arrived at the wizard's house. He knocked at the door and waited. Finally, the door opened and there stood the old wizard. The little boy was afraid and then the wizard said, how may I help you, my son? The little boy took a deep breath and then told the wizard he had a question for him. The wizard said, of course, what is your question? The little boy then said, I have a bird in my hand. Is he alive? or not. The old wizard thought for a moment and then he began to smile and said, well, if I tell you the bird is alive, all you will have to do is hold him very tight until he can't breathe any longer and if it, until his breathing stops. All you will have to do is open your hand and he will fly away. So you see, my son, you have the answer in your hands. The Good Samaritan saw an opportunity to serve and he took action. He got involved and he didn't say let someone else do it. So let us be the church as we continue to go forward. Be the church you've always been. Be the church that has meant so much to so many. Work together, stay together. Listen to your inner voice and ask, what does God have for us to do? Don't be afraid and know that God is with you. For I truly believe the answers will be known to you and they will be in your hands someday in the near future.